As robots and machines steal jobs, we look at the future of work. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Peter Ward, Operations Management Professor at Ohio State University. Lauren Stone, Vice President of Robotics Education at the Tesla Foundation. And Stephanie Wilk, Management and Human Resources Professor at Ohio State University. Welcome to this Columbus on the Record special. This week we take a step back and look at an issue that affects politics and policies and frankly how we're going to make a living in the years to come. A lot has changed in the days since the Industrial Revolution. Companies are turning to robots, automation, artificial intelligence to produce products and services. Humans many times are too expensive and unnecessary. Industry observers say we're on the cusp of a fourth Industrial Revolution. Many fear we're heading towards a future where jobs no longer exist. Peter Ward, that's a drastic fear. How did we get to where we are today? What's the evolution of this? Well, you know, we've uh, mechanization and, and, and taking the uh, human element out of work has been, uh, been, you know, been evolving for many, many years. Uh, really, automation, which involves a programmable element or an intelligence, uh, started in the uh, in the 1960s, and we've had uh, you know tremendous growth over the over the ensuing decades in, in uh, terms of uh, what machines can do. And uh, the you know you know we think about uh, you know I have Alexa in my uh, in my kitchen, and uh, Alexa does all kinds of things for me. Uh, this is and the voice activated. The voice, exactly, the, the Amazon device that, that can play the radio for you and tell you, uh, you know, what, who won the 1966 World Series and, yeah. and things like that. Uh, but there's all kinds of applications in, in, in work that involve, uh, you know, first automation of, of uh, you know, uh, 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 factory work um, and um, eventually uh, automation in, in offices. Uh, and uh, then more and more service work uh, has has been automated in one way or another. Mm -hmm. So it's been a, a you know a, a kind of a, a you know one industry after another uh, with more and more fraction of automated jobs. I don't know who can answer this, but is it safe? Is it is it fair to say this is a, our fourth industrial revolution? I mean, this. I mean, if you think about it. I mean, we've been using technology since the first guy figured out that a, a rock that was round could be used as a wheel to move something down the hill. I mean, is there is it more of an evolution of technology, and it's just that this is just a continuation of the process. You know, it's interesting when you think back to a period in the early 1900s, right? So when you had electrification merging with flight, mechanical, and everything, and how transformative that was. That's what, what this is. It's so transformable to what that compared even more so because now you have the intelligence where it's thinking for itself, potentially answering back to you. Yeah. So yes, I would say yes, we are evolving to that. So forth. it's a, more of a more than just a series of revolutions. It's just an evolution, continuing process. Yes. Is it faster now? Is it? Is it, um, what's the difference? Is, is it the speed, the changes coming at us? It, it can be speed, but it's also the type of work that's being automated as well. I mean, when we think about um, the thinking that mm. some of these computers can do, um, it's not just the person on the line that was tightening a bolt, that we now can get a machine or a robot to do that. That early was in factories, you know, in, in you know, 25, 30 years ago, I was working on automating factories. Um, that was my job, and, and part of it was teaching people then how to not deal with the machine, but deal with the computer screen. Right. Now, what they're doing is is a different kind of work. It's not just those easy mechanical pieces. It's really thinking about um, what needs to be done next, and that part of it is where I think it starts to step on even more kind of human mm -hmm. toes. Mm -hmm. What drives it? Is it always money, Peter, that drives this? that it's always looking for increased efficiencies, uh, lower cost to produce, mm -hmm. higher profits? Yeah, well, it, it, it's money, um, it's quality. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, there, there are a lot of drivers, but, but you know, essentially we're, uh, we're economic, economic people. And uh, the, uh, so, so largely it comes down to, uh, to uh, saving labor and thus uh, saving costs. There are times when it's also about uh, 
uh, making jobs safer, uh, which is you know a, a, another application, and, and, and also quality. There are times when uh, we can just do a better job with uh, using using automation. You know, a great example of that is is uh, when we think about the surgical robots. Yeah. Mm. You know, where yeah. uh, certainly very very costly, uh, but not, nonetheless uh, you know worth it in terms of uh, the the potential for, for greater accuracy. The argument. Go ahead. Um, the the research on services would also say that we as consumers are actually wanting it because we want that standardization. We want, the, we want it to be the same regardless of who's on the other side, or we want to be involved in the process and we want to co-produce because we don't want to wait for somebody else to look for our bank balance. If mm -hmm. we can do it ourselves, we'd rather do it ourselves mm -hmm. because we can control that and then control the time that we spend on it. And we want low cost goods. And that goes to both automation and you know sure. offshoring of products. I mean, Absolutely. we want to buy our TV or our car for as low as price as possible and automation helps helps with that. And I think that's what's overlooked a lot. You know, there's always this fear that automation is, you know, that's the topic today, taking away jobs, but if anything, it frees up the potential for new jobs, but also reduces costs, which makes the lifestyle increase potentially, the, you know, the consumer goods increase, which drives commerce, which drives development and innovation. Do we really replace the jobs that have been lost on the factory floor um, with other jobs? What, what is the math? What does the research show on that? That's what economists say that you, you put robots on the factory floor, that leads to other jobs to create the robots or to do other things. Mm. It's true, and, and you can look at that throughout history. You know, I mean, there's always been improvement in technology, the, the weaving industry, you know, I mm -hmm. mean, with what happened there and how much it was changed in a sense of labor, labor was reduced, I think, 98%, but then it created more jobs in managing that. You know, the banking industry, what it did with ATMs, just even thinking in automation in that aspect, 43% increase in banks after a result of that, despite the fact that tower jobs went down. So where it's manufacturing or jobs, yes, there's a reduction, but then usually other jobs will blossom out of that and managing that. Yeah, the, I think the challenge is that there are, uh, the jobs that are being replaced are not necessarily uh, available to the people who've been Right. displaced yeah. and that's uh, that's that's really the the difficulty and I think from a policy policy perspective we have to think about how do we get people trained and in ways that will allow them to uh, you know to continue to work and to continue to be productive is that anything new to the, to our generation I mean when the textile mills are in the Northeast and they moved down south yeah. for a while then they went offshore and automation reduced jobs even more those folks f faced the same thing you know 150 years ago sure sure I think the difference is that if uh, in, a, in a mechanical age if you were uh, able to, you know, to work work around machines and and uh, you could you could be successful, you could find other jobs hard because whole industries left. Uh, but what we're talking about today is replacing people who are not uh, necessarily literate uh, with respect to digital technology, mm -hmm. and then that's a, a, a it's much harder for them to find that 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 equal job uh, in a in a age when uh, digital becomes very, very important. And, and we hear of college campuses, for example, starting to require students um, in their first year to take a coding class because wow. we're starting to realize we don't have the pipeline of people because we don't want you tightening the bolt, we actually need you running the system that will tighten the bolt and being able to troubleshoot that. And so we need coders, we need people that are thinking about the technology and the AI um, types of work Artificial because yeah right. absolutely yeah, yeah. and all, all this talk about you know the digital natives and the yeah. great advantage that kids have you know I think the the uh, the issue is that yeah they're, they're, they're familiar with with uh, digital technology uh, but actually doing work with digital technology is quite different so so that that notion of coding coding and and uh, uh, teaching young people to code and, and 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 really encouraging that I think is, is terribly important and we often lose that okay it wasn't long ago when robots were considered science fiction today they not only are real, but they're getting better and faster at doing jobs once done by men and women. Look around, you'll find robots in hotels and hospitals, fast food change, installing self-service kiosks all over the place. Companies are testing out drone delivery, and driverless cars are, of course, right around the corner. Uh, Lauren Stone, which industry is our robotics, for instance, right now? The, the, have the big, which, in which industry are robotics the, have the largest presence? Is it manufacturing still? It has Manu been for 20 years. Yeah, I, I couldn't quote exactly the statistic. I, I will say I don't know that, but manufacturing, the logistics industry, the impact of that, but um, the speed at which this is happening is speeding up this across all industry. You know, 
What, are, what, are the, what is the potential of robots? I saw a, a video of a robot security guard. Hmm. We see mm -hmm. NFL training camps mm -hmm. with robotic tackling dummies. I yeah. mean, mm -hmm. yeah. and in hospitals, whether it's in the back end in terms of logistics or literally doing your surgery for you, so they're they're doing lots of very important jobs. Yeah, the medical industry alone. I mean, it's it's a repeated task and diagnostic task. It's all about data. So ultimately, if you get an analyzation of data and the medical right. aspect of that, you can in reality get a much better result than the human mm -hmm. and that, but then you're integrating the human within that process and creating that cyber fiscal interaction. For those of us who haven't been in an operating room or at least conscious in one for a while, I mean, how is the robot working in surgery? Is, it, is it somebody's operating it, correct? Sure, the surgeon is, uh, is operating it. The, the surgeons are uh, surgeons who are capable of, of, of working with, uh, with robots who have been trained in it and uh, you know, are, are in great demand. Um, but the, the, so it's a, a, a highly skilled surgeon and uh, a robot that has, uh, is able to uh, move with, with greater precision uh, than humans typically can. And that's, that's, the, that's the trick there. Well, Columbus is home because of its location and transportation, infrastructure, logistics, and warehousing. What's going to be the impact of, mm. and they're very automated now, but only gonna get more so. What's mm -hmm. the impact of robotics and automation in that industry here? Oh, enormous, mm -hmm. enormous. Uh, you know, it is uh, every year there's, uh, you know, one way to talk, talk about it, I think a positive way to talk about it is, is the productivity of each worker uh, just in, increases each year in those industries in particular. You know, services have, have lagged behind. And I think that, you know, we, th we talk about this new industrial age, I think the real impact in, on that is that uh, we're now seeing services absorbing the same sorts of, of, uh, of change uh, that we previously saw in manufacturing, and if you go back and think even in agriculture uh, before yeah. that, uh, there's a you know a, a you know a, a, a certainly decades long uh, trend of more and more uh, more and more automation, uh, and it's now hitting in in places that it didn't hit before. And when you think about, for example, in the logistics side, grocery stores, mm -hmm. and sure. when they went into barcoding of products so they could track, et cetera, but now we're moving into self-service kiosks in which you know, we as consumers are checking ourselves out, weighing our own fruits and vegetables, and the technology is there to be able to read and understand things, and those are even getting better over the course of the last couple of years and in just my own experience in using them, and they'll get better still, mm -hmm. um, in which we're automating, you know, taking some industry and, and pushing that boundary further and further. I mean, self-service gas stations. I mean, absolutely. absolutely. Was that I mean, they, they, sixty-four, I think. Mm -hmm. was first. I mean, they started mm -hmm. with you had to have a person in the booth, and you had to give them twenty bucks to fill up, or at the time, probably five bucks to fill up your car. <laughs> and now you can, you don't even need that person. You do it at the credit card, and you don't even have to say hello. In fact, some of us, like myself, don't want to see that person. I don't mm -hmm. want to stand in line behind the cigarette purchasers and the lottery ticket buyers. But interesting with that example, to the point of the discussion more jobs were created despite the technology. So as the cost went down in the fueling stations, then you had these mini markets pop up. It was a shift in the development of that mm -hmm. service level. And so then other things were born from that. We have no way of predicting out of AI and what's gonna happen, what these unknown jobs are going to be. And that's what, to me, it's an exciting opportunity right now. We have but, to embrace it. But you went from the self the guy who pumped your gas, mm -hmm. then that person went to the mini mart, well, now that mini mart's been replaced by a kiosk self-serve, so what's left after that? I guess that's the fear that's, that people have. Of course, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. and, and understandably, and you know, I think just from my perspective personally, you, you have to embrace change. I know that's scary, but as we've counted through history, is we we keep improving our work-life balance. We have to upskill. Of course, there is going to be a growing pain right now. There is going to be a transition because of the speed with which things are taking place. How about things that you you think about? you know, self-serve kiosks at the grocery stores uh, or at the gas station, automation in the factory floor, even at the warehouse floor. But what about artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and the legal field? How is happening there with sort of, how's, how, is, how are robots and artificial intelligence devices affecting those professions which you wouldn't think of? Well, this is where you go back to data. And what they do is they're looking for patterns. Um, we have artificial intelligence that can read emotions of people, that can um, look at all kinds of data points and understand uh, a pattern, picking juries, for example, um, looking at f facial recognition of mood and reaction to various questions. Um, it can uh, scour through 
tons of legal history to be able to pull out themes or ideas or things. I mean, it just, to me, that, that kind of technology augments mm. Um, mm. the knowledge that the individuals will have, but then that's where the human um, AI interface is really required. We need to figure out how to use it in its most effective way to be able to, um, to really leverage it. Yeah, and increasingly, the, uh, the move is from uh, artificial intelligence being able to do the routine and you know recognize patterns and look at lots, right. lots of data very very quickly uh, to do more and more nuanced uh, to where the uh, you know the 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 le less routine work can now be taken on by the uh, by the machine, which implies fewer and fewer people in that in in those jobs, and I think that's the that, that's sort of the risk and the fear. All right. Researchers at Oxford University estimate that 47 percent of U.S. jobs could be automated, as we've been talking about, within the next, within the next two decades. The skills that were once in demand are now obsolete, and that means pursuing different kinds of education, <coughs> investing in job training and retraining programs, and picking up skills that can compete with machines uh, will become even more necessary. Stephanie Wilk, how do you, if you're a factory worker and you need to find a new job, what choices do you have? What do you have to do? You're going to have to retrain in some of these new technologies. And there's lots of uh, work training programs, whether it's at universities or other kinds of um, organizations that support. Even unions are, are out there retraining workers to be able to take on these new jobs and to have those skill sets around um, uh, coding or managing and, and even shifting from maybe um, uh, maintaining certain kinds of machinery to maintaining different, you know, th this new machinery that's now going to be running the, 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 sh the floors. So I think that there's opportunities for us as an educational institution to also tap into that um, and seeing this kind of uh, focus on teaching and getting a pipeline of people out there is also really important. So it's not only the retraining, but also making sure we have a pipeline of people to be on the on the cutting edge. Realistically, if you have just a high school diploma, you've been working on the factory floor yeah. for 20 years, how realistic is it for that person to to pick up a new skill quickly enough to get another job? And while he or she is competing with somebody who is 25 years old coming coming out of college. That's a hard one. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that part of it is that you have to have a willingness and you have to be able, right? Those are the two pieces. And um, for some, they may feel like they aren't able, but I also think that there's a group of people out there who feel unwilling. They don't think they're quite, you know, they don't know that what they're capable of doing because they haven't tried it before. Um, you know, I think that there are some people that are going to have to really think, rethink what they do. But I also think that there's opportunities for some of these folks to be trained. And we hear these stories in the educational world all the time of the person that was, you know, working as a cashier and eventually lost their job, but came back and started to think about um, a new business idea or something else. And they and they they retrain themselves in other ways. Um, so I think that there are there is a pool. I mean, my dad was one of those people. He worked on a in a factory floor for 35 years. He's now 88. Um, and I, th when you when you tell that story, I think this is you know what would my dad have done. Um, and there are things I think he could have done, but you have to look for the, where those opportunities are. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to lie and say that I think these folks could be retrained to be AI, you know, specialists. Right, is the private sector doing enough with retraining? Or are they relying too much on, say, Columbus State Community College or Ohio State or, or other education institutions to do that retraining for them? Yeah, this is, being an entrepreneur, yeah. these are exciting times. There's never been more energy flowing from an entrepreneurial landscape and public and private partnerships. Now, we have a long way to go, you know, but when you look at Columbus and just what's happening with Smart City, you have Idea Foundry, we're involved with Autonomy Hub. So you have a lot of these organizations that are developing programs that really are taking away those barriers. So yes, it is a partnership. I don't think anyone's doing enough, mm -hmm. but together we need to do more. How has job training changed in, in the private sector? I mean, you know, IBM and GE used to have extensive employee training programs. Are they still around or they farm that out to colleges and universities? Some companies are really doubling down and, and spending money on retraining um, and some just don't have the resources in the pockets to do it. And plus they're also looking at the automation that they've invested in and saying we're trying to get those efficiencies um, you know do we now have to turn around and spend all this money on training and development and the, and the trick for for um, organizations is it, it's a long-term investment. Mm -hmm. 
to, to reinvest in workers requires you to think about um, your workplace in two years time or five years time, not tomorrow. And that is a hard, in, in today's times, it's sometimes hard, hard for, to predict what, it's what hard to predict need. what you're gonna need and it's also hard to make that investment and make an argument to your shareholders that this is a good investment when you're not gonna see return on it for a while. That's an incredible point. I, I think that's where corporations have to step up and get more involved because that's yeah. what it's gonna take. It takes that partnership, prototyping, creating mm -hmm. programs where people can get involved at all levels. All right, a final topic, advances in technology have ushered in a new wave of automation as machines match or outperform the humans. Still, the world won't be run by robots. It won't happen overnight. Peter Ward, what is the, what's the, how long is it, what's, where's the tipping point? Is there a tipping point? I mean, at some point, if every warehouse, factory, hospital is more and more automated? Yeah, I think that uh, we are, uh, we're, we're approaching a tipping point um, as the, uh, you know, we've really seen a, a a speeding up of the adoption of, of uh, automated technologies. And I think that it, it, it takes a while for that to, to sort of play itself out in the, in the labor market. But I think we're getting to, the, we're getting to that point. And uh, there is, uh, there is gonna be a, a, a shakeout. I mean, I think what we, when we think about young people, well, there's, uh, what we really wanna do is, is uh, educate them in, in ways that are going to allow them to be flexible and, and to, to change over, uh, over time. My, where my heart goes out is to the 50 year old mm -hmm. who has uh, had a, you know, a, a, a productive career uh, but did not have the education uh, uh, needed to, to, to go and, and uh, adapt and that's a, that's a much, much harder, uh, uh, harder trick and I think we have to work on uh, how to educate those those people and, and allow them to have the, the full career. Is there is the social compact that companies have now the same as it was decades ago? I read about how Kodak delayed an implementation yeah. of the yeah. film developing system to protect a certain group of workers who are nearing retirement so they wouldn't lose their jobs. I just can't see that happening today with the pressure on companies, public companies especially, to meet Wall Street expectations and to lower cost. And, is that still out there? I think that's changed um, dramatically. I mean, I think that <coughs> we went from kind of that old deal where the company uh, was in charge of your career to kind of a new deal in which the individual is starting to be in control, which means that the company can kind of say, you know, you're on your own to learn new skills, et cetera. I think we've gotten to the point, particularly for certain skill sets, in which we're shifting to kind of what I'm going to call the new New Deal. Uh, Peter Capelli has also talked about this. Um, and, 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 you know, one of the things that has been really interesting about that is that we're starting to see for certain skill sets this desire on the company's part to get involved because they want to retain that person and retain that intellectual um, capital. That, that, that it will be useful for them, particularly as they're going forward. So I think everyone now has a different contract in the organization, and I think that's what's tricky about it. You're an entrepreneur. Are there enough vacancies in the entrepreneurial world to pick up some of this slack? Sky's the limit. I mean, you, to me, it, it's a lab environment right now because you're at the front of the frontier. I always give the example and explaining it to people who imagine the Wild West when you were walking down the dust-covered streets and the you know, the horses everywhere and there came that steam Model T or the steam locomotive, how foreign that had to have seemed, but the amount of em enterprise that developed from there, where it's something to me that's exponentially. You just have to step off and get involved and learn and just take a chance. Any jobs that are completely safe from this trend? Mm. <laughs> plumber, I think about a plumber. <laughs> I mean, or yeah. uh, the arts. a teacher. The arts, mm -hmm. there's a huge opportunity here because when you're talking steam, the arts area, because of typically in history, when things improved, people had more time. So then the arts actually flourished from movies mm. and whatnot. So this is an opportunity for the arts where probably it has not been given enough attention over the years for mm. it to really flourish. So I do think that you don't have to be tech oriented. You're gonna see a merge mm -hmm. of these two. Mm -hmm. All right. Good news for the artists, okay? Absolutely. We end each show with a final, what we call off the record, parting shot, a final thought on this topic of the future of work and how we're all gonna make a living in 20 years. Peter Ward, we'll start with you. Yeah, my advice would be that um, kids who are in school should learn uh, basic coding, uh, learn math, and learn to communicate. And that will give them the, the, the flexibility to, to move forward in, in, in their careers no matter what happens. 
Lauren. You know, I wasn't a, a, a lover of math when I was younger, but you, you, you got to get involved in the STEM side of things, the science, the technology, engineering, math, and of course the arts. And then from an entrepreneurial standpoint, just dive in. It doesn't matter if you are one that thinks that you can create a job or create a company, just get involved. There's so many resources wherever you are, especially here in Columbus. Okay. And Stephanie. I'm gonna switch gears and talk about the consumer side of things, uh, particularly with services. Now that we're doing more automation, we have to see ourselves as co-producers, um, that we work, are working with the person at the checkout. We are working with the person um, mm -hmm. on, in the, on the phones that we're talking to in the call centers, which is an area I study. We have to think of ourselves as co-producers of our services. I predict that uh, journalists will never be automated because who else a politician is going to blame when things go wrong? You've got to have someone to shoot. Yep. We'll always be the messenger. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. We urge you to check us out online, Facebook and Twitter, and you can see each episode on demand at our website, WOSU.org. For our panel here and for our crew, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.